it's a pleasure and I'm going to give a sort of somewhat technical talk so or at least uh, I'll try to prove something um, what I'm going to talk about is a joint work with Doris Hein and Umberto Hrenevitz and Leonardo Macarini. And our goal is to prove the following theorem. Let's take the three-dimensional sphere Sometimes it's convenient to think of it as an n plus one dimensional sphere with a contact form alpha, um, which gives rise to the standard contact structure. So curl alpha is the standard contact structure. Then the assertion is that um, the rep law of alpha has at least two closed rep orbits. This is greater than or equal. Uh, Well, what else can it be? All right. So uh, and now I'm going to go through like a long list of fine print kind of legal disclaimers. Uh, I'm not claiming that. Okay. Th they are, of course, linked, but I'm not claiming to be able to prove that. Um, first of all, like the first disclaimer is that it is known. It has been proved, and there is a paper by someone I don't know personally, uh, Christopher Gardiner. Christopher Gardiner and Hutchings. I think maybe a couple of months back, uh, proved this result. Uh, secondly, it's certainly known in the non-degenerate case and I bet in all dimensions. In dimension three, it's pretty obvious. And uh, probably Nancy would, would correct me, but uh, I'm pretty sure Long must have proven it in all dimensions in the non-degenerate case. It looks again in dimension three. It's absolutely uh, it's immediate. Oh, so the, the Poincaré map, map has no eigenvalues equal to one. The next. Disclaimer is, all right, what I'm going to tell you is from my perspective a proof, or at least it's something that can pass for a proof given sort of how lax uh, our standards are. Um, the reason it's not actually a proof, th there are actually two reasons why it's not a written proof. First of all, First of all, it seriously uses contact homology, and as we know, like at this moment, contact homology doesn't really exist. No, I'm talking about uh, uh, my proof, <laughs> our proof. Our proof, is, the, the proof, as far as I understand, is complete and correct and everything. Sort of our proof is not quite a proof for two reasons. Uh, the first reason is that it uses, like, 
ordinary contact homology and that an object which does not quite exist as, at least as of today. And the second reason is that there are sort of, in addition to that, there are a lot of technical moves which are quite standard and clear, but we have not gone through. Um, and finally, the last disclaimer, I'm not sure the whole thing will ever be written up in detail. Uh, for one reason, it seems like the chance that something gets done are in worse proportional to the number of people involved. And here we have like four people, including myself. <laughs> so I, or at least the amount of time it takes. So I'm not quite sure we will write it up in detail. However, the proof is what I'm going to say, I think, is an interesting argument. And it's, it's very obvious in some sense. And uh, except, for one st except for one step, it works in all dimensions. There is just one localized point which kind of requires the dimension uh, to be exactly three. And if one can get, get through that, then one can do all dimensions. So now I'm trying to prove it. <laughs> so the first step, I want to discuss the relation between local contact homology versus local Fleur homology. <coughs> so let's take a contact manifold M alpha. It can be everything from now on is 2n plus 1 dimensional, and I'm going to spell it out explicitly when 2n plus 1 becomes 3. And let's say x is a closed rib orbit. Oh, no, 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 no. I'm not claiming. No, no, no. No, no, no. In higher dimensions, first of all, I have no claim about higher dimensions. But if I did by this method, it would still be 2. No. Yeah, uh, think of, uh, uh, <laughs> of the boundary of a star-shaped domain. <laughs> this is kind of a more pedestrian way to say it. Um, uh, well, now I'm going to go through the proof. And uh, this point works for any contact manifold in any contact dimension. It's actually a local fact. So let me get to it. Uh, let x be a closed wrap orbit. And I want it to be isolated, and I want it to be isolated for all iterations. So if I denote by x to the k the iterated orbit, I want them to be all isolated. Now, given an orbit, I can take a cross section and look at the Poincaré return map. And likewise, I have the Poincaré return map for the uh, iterated orbit, which is just the uh, iteration of the Poincaré return. Uh, uh, just reverse it k times. Now, whenever you do this sort of math, you usually do some sort of Morse theory. So there is a Hamiltonian version of Morse theory, which is called Fleur theory. And supposedly, there should be a contact version for closed rep orbits of Morse theory, which is called contact homology. Um, so whenever you have a Morse theory, you have a local version of it. You can take your critical point, which, is, which may be degenerate or non-degenerate, but got to be isolated, <coughs> perturb it a little bit, 
it breaks down, perturb your function or functional a little bit. It breaks down into some non-degenerate point, and then one can form a, a complex out of them, a Morse complex. Uh, in, in Morse theory, this is, in classical Morse theory, these are called critical modules, I think, right? So, but this, um, one can do the same in contact homology or in Fleur theory. So let's denote the contact homology. The contact homology of the orbit X, uh, sorry, by H C of alpha and X. And likewise, I can do the contact homology for the iterated orbit. On the other hand, I can take the Poincaré return map and do the local Fleur homology of the, uh, of the Poincaré return map. And maybe I write here, let me write X. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing, uh, I'm doing essentially the, the cylindrical contact homology. Pretty much the most basic version. And I claim that the two are equal. Or isomorphic. This is not quite literally true. So I need to fix the statement to make this quite true. First of all, I work over the rational coefficients. This is important for at least this part is not defined, uh, has no chance of being defined as of now when the coefficients are irrational, but there are other parts. Secondly, um, what I need to put here is not quite the Fleur homology, but the equivalent Fleur homology. What I'm looking here at is the uh, k times iterated return map. Think of a, a sort of k time iterated Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. There is a natural zk action on uh, the space of uh, fixed points or periodic <laughs> orbits, and I can do very naturally zk equivalent homology. It makes relatively little difference when I work over rational coefficients, but it does. And I will get to that. And finally, uh, traditionally, these two are graded in a different way. I'm assuming that the right-hand side is graded simply by the con lysander index. And the con lysander index, so in my conventions, uh, is defined so that a, flat, a relatively flat maximum, the maximum with small eigenvalues has index n. This is a picture of the maximum with small eigenvalues has index n. This thing is graded by the con Lysander index, and with my conventions that the manifold is 2n plus 1 dimensional, what I got to do, I have to add n and subtract 2. Yeah, so to match con Lysander and con Lysander here, I have to shift the degree by plus 2 minus n. Now I think this is the accurate statement. I am going to outline the proof of it and show why the equivalence is important here, or at least uh, illustrated by an example later at the end of the talk if I have time. Uh, one important point is that if k is equal to 1, this is a known and proved fact. It's contained in 
uh, paper by Eliasberg and Kim and Poutrovich. In fact, if you sort of examine this uh, statement just a little bit more carefully, you can see immediately that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence on the level of generators of complexes. And this is actually why you need Z, one reason why you need ZK here. Just uh, orbits correspond to orbits. Uh, as far as I understand, I could not sort of figure out a setup so that there would be a, a correspondence on the level of complexes so that the differentials would match. It, uh, at least I could not figure out how to do it. So there is a little bit to prove here, even when k is equal to 1. But they, uh, they do it fine. By the way, when k is equal to 1, th there are absolutely no difficulties in, in the definition of contact homology. So everything in the cylindrical case uh, goes through easily. In their paper, this is a statement that the homology of a Hamiltonian structure is independent of the framing. So this is, a, this is what they actually prove, homology of a Hamiltonian structure is independent of the framing. All right, this is the part one. This is something I want to know. Part two, symplectically degenerate maxima. Um, yeah. For, uh, for each k and for all k's, I'm not sure what the difference is. Given a, for, for each k, you have this group and that group, and they're equal. Therefore, they're equal for all k's. Uh, but we are referring to, to at the level, the level the context from a discrete <coughs> uh, I'm assuming that the orbit uh, uh, x and all its iterations are isolated. This is a local fact. It, everything is uh, happening here in the neighborhood of the orbit x. Actually, I don't even need the ambient manifold. So um, what I didn't quite say is what I need, I need actually uh, a structure of a tubular <laughs> neighborhood of x. So I need to, need to fix um, the... Uh, product decomposition sort of on the neighborhood of x, S1 cross some ball. And moreover, I need to do it so that if I take D alpha and restrict it to every cross section, to every horizontal slice, I get the same symplectic flow. This is independent <coughs> of T. Um, the, the point here is that this part is actually defined not just for the return map. It requires a path, at least to have the grading fix. I need to sort of, uh, I need to have a path in the group of Hamiltonian diffeomorphism. So the point, this is where the grading comes from. And I also need a trivialization to fix the grading, and that comes from. I actually need the trivialization along the orbit in both parts, and that comes from this product decomposition. I just um, fix a frame in between, so I need, uh, I need a frame. So this is also a source of frame along x, so x to the k. All right. So symplectically degenerate maxima. Now I'm going to look at phi or uh, this whole path phi t of going from one cross section to the next one. So this is a uh, this is a germ a path of germs of Hamiltonian diffeomorphisms and. So I have the phi t 
from a ball to itself, fixing the center of the ball. I, uh, if the orbit is x, I'm going to uh, use the same not notation x for the fixed point. And I assume that it is isolated for all uh, iterations. So it remains isolated for all iterations. Then by definition, I say that x is an SDM, a symplectically degenerate maximum. I say a couple of words on why this name. If, first of all, x is totally degenerate, meaning all eigenvalues of d phi are equal to 1. I'm not saying d phi is identity. It can have some off-diagonal part, but uh, one can make it upper triangular with all eigenvalues equal to 1. And secondly, I want to say that the, uh, the log of Fleur homology of phi at x in the top degree is non-zero. So if you take a flat isolated maximum, and flat meaning really flat with zero eigenvalues, this will be exactly the case. So to have an example. A flat isolated, a truly flat isolated maximum. An equivalent condition is, rather than uh, given here a geometrical condition that x is totally degenerate, I can actually say that I, I can say it uh, in purely homological terms that the homology is non-zero and remains non-zero for an infinite sequence of iterations. for some sequence going to infinity. Uh-huh. Yeah, sure. <coughs> I can I imagine the whole DCM where it maps from ECR to ECR? It doesn't matter. It's a germ. It doesn't have to be defined on the whole ball. Suffice it to <coughs> have it defined on some neighborhood of a point. Uh, it doesn't have it. You can think, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a germ. In this context, it's just a germ. So it's not okay. Yeah. Um, Whatever the difference, something defined on an arbitrarily small neighborhood of uh, X and sending it to a ball, yes, a pair of balls. And this pair of balls, I mean, you can shrink the domain one depending on the order of iteration. Yeah. J just as it would be for the return map. So, and again, in fact, to have everything here done correctly, I need the whole path. Just uh, one return map is not quite enough. Now a lemma. Uh-huh. What do you mean maximum? Oh, let's take your Hamiltonian. So th this is an example. Th this one. Uh-huh. Ah, what is, well, maximum is here. Why it is symplectically the yeah, I'm going to uh, say, say, say by maximum, and I'm going to say why, uh, explain why it's it, it nonetheless a bad name. I'm going to answer your question nonetheless. Here is a lemma, uh, which is justly called uh, Hingston's lemma. So assume that X is an SDM. Then there exists a Hamiltonian generating phi. As I said, the input here is actually the whole uh, path phi t. I'm not attempting to generate this path. 
but the uh, net result, the, uh, the time one map, got to be the same. It's actually important. I, the, uh, the flow of this guy can be different from the original one. So generating this uh, time one map such that the first point is HT has an isolated maximum at x. Secondly, it's a Hessian. Hessian need not be zero, but it has zero eigenvalues. And the last condition, which is important, but uh, which I'm not going to explicitly use in this talk, is that it actually depends on time in a very minor way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, so that's not a Hessian that the flow. The Hessian, uh, the Hessian would be x squared. The Hessian x squared plus 0 times y squared, when you think of it as uh, what are the Hamilton, uh, what are eigenvalues of um, of a quadratic form on its symplectic vector space. By definition, you take the Hamiltonian vector field of your quadratic form and the eigenvalues of that matrix. Okay, so it's not, it's not d it is d, d squared of the Hamiltonian, but when you say eigenvalues, you mean the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian. It's the official definition. This is how it no, it's not my. It's uh, like if you go. Yeah, but a Hessian of a function on a vector space does not have eigenvalues. On a well defined, doesn't have well defined eigenvalues. So, no, I, th I think this is, uh, if you take like a mechanics book. Or Starting with R nodes and probably before R nodes, this is how they would be defined. And probably in your, uh, in, in Conley Zender as well. And uh, Hofer Zender and everywhere. Eddie? Are you on my side? I think in Hofer <laughs> Zender. All right. In any event, it's a bad name for a different reason. It's a bad name because it should be something like uh, degenerate symplectic maximum rather than symplectically degenerate, because it's truly degenerate, but it's a symplectic maximum. So maybe I should change that. So in any event, this is like a key point of all uh, arguments of this type, which uh, lets you translate homological information to geometrical information. The uh, notion, the definition actually, the notion, goes back to uh, Hinston's paper on the Conley conjecture. I think that's how I gave it, but uh, the uh, notion is essentially in, uh, phrased uh, slightly differently in Hinston's paper. And the lemma is proves that, uh, or in, in my paper too. But it means is fully responsible for the whole thing, for this part of the talk. Don't blame me. My contribution is just a bad name. <laughs> All right. <coughs> uh, so the next part, what does it all have to do? Yeah, I probably didn't tell you that the idea of the proof of this theorem is just to take the proof of the Conley conjecture and somehow uh, Translate it to this language to plant it on this contact sphere, replant it on this contact sphere. So, going on to the next step, 
let's state the following lemma. So let S3 alpha be as in the theorem. And let's assume there is just one <coughs> clustered orbit. then x is an SDM. And by that, I mean the return map of x is a simplectically degenerate maximum. And this is the only part where, uh, in, in this argument, where we need the manifold to be three-dimensional, where we need the sphere to be three-dimensional. The proof, unfortunately, sort of has three counterparts. Let's call this theorem, let's call it theorem one. So it combines three things, theorem one, which tells us what to look for. The homological information, plus some simple index analysis, plus an injection of uh, hopper wysotsky zender unfortunately. Which is also very three-dimensional. Actually, the index analysis is three-dimensional. Uh, three I did not really push it hard enough um, maybe one can sort of get rid of it, but at the moment, both index analysis and the little injection to eliminate some cases um, are required here. So this is like the three-dimensional counterpart. <coughs> well, now we are all set for sort of the main result. So I'm doing the, I'm going to the next step. Theorem two. So I'm back to the two n plus one dimensional sphere now with the with a contact form which gives rise to the standard contact structure. Again, think of the boundary of a smooth star-shaped domain. And I assume that it has an orbit which is an SDM. This implicitly degenerate maximum. Then it has infinitely many periodic. And from now on, actually, the proof of the theorem follows very closely the Hamiltonian, the, uh, the proof of the Hamiltonian convicton picture. Just basically, you, uh, you either have to redo everything or work a little bit to sort of to so, uh, sort of to embed the Hamiltonian counterpart into the contact counterpart. I'm going to again go through the steps. Are there any, any questions? So as I said, you, uh -huh. uh, no, 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 wait. Uh, these are the two, two uh, three-dimensional parts in the proof of the lemma. And, and it's, it's kind of, uh, this lemma is two-thirds three-dimensional, okay? <laughs> Sorry, no. <laughs> two-thirds, yeah. Well. Uh, other questions, please. And uh, probably you can imagine why I'm not so sure it's going to be written because I wrote this thing at least twice in my life by now, so I'm not sure I'm <laughs> myself after <laughs> writing it the third time. Uh, uh, well, I have uh, I have already like three people <laughs> there, there, so um, I don't know. All right. In any event, let's try. And probably this will work actually in any contact manifold. It doesn't really have to be a sphere, as long as everything is defined. All right, now I, I want to.
state it more explicitly what I am going to prove, theorem 3. So let's denote <laughs> the action of x by c. So c by definition, the, x, the action, this is just the integral over x of lambda, of alpha, of your, of the context. So if there would be only two uh, equivalent orders, so then there's the thing has to be one to one. Uh, no, I, I, I'm actually confident, no. Uh, whereas I can or not, it's a different issue, but uh, it's, it's sort of something I would like to do at some point. Uh, it, this actually in dimension three, it may be known. Um, no, I mean, I'm talking about dimension three. The, yeah, it may be known. There may be. So other, you can have multi-level There may be. Oh, oh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, okay, 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 okay. I, uh, I'm with you. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Okay, Sorry. So, so the picture Sorry. would be if there are only two, they are linked and they are non degenerate. Yeah, yeah. otherwise you have, yeah. Yeah, and the list of and the, yeah, this is how it should be. Sorry, yeah, I, I sort of was thinking about something else, yes. Uh, yeah. I think if you have just two, they got to be non degenerate. Uh, if, if there are only two, they got to be non degenerate. This is what I was arguing with. This is what I'm trying. I was trying to say that uh, no, this I don't believe it. No, but it's, it's related to uh, this global uh, version of that with the uh, er, yeah. There is a paper of Erman and Fatih which I think nearly gives a counterexample. Oh, oh, Diophantine. Okay. I don't know. I mean, then if that would be true, then, uh, I don't know. Um, maybe you're right, yeah. You said Diophantine. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, 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 because uh, otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. otherwise it's probably infinity. Infinity, yeah. Is yeah, it? So, uh, so it should be a really very nice appealing picture. So you, so you have all these uh, linked periodic orders, and then you should have, a, even if you don't have a goal and you define the term, that there should be a solution to wind around these two linked guys and have a rotation number. And then the, ra the ratio of these two numbers is related to the rotation numbers near the periodic orders. I mean, we have, I mean, by, by the results we know it, mm -hmm. it seems to be conversion or something like that. And then if you have only two and you know it's uh, the then that thing is presumably by all KM theory, which you guys have improved this year, should, <laughs> should be the list size. <laughs> all right, so uh, theorem two, that there are infinitely many, follows in turn from the following statement. Let me take the contact homology <laughs> now of my sphere and I wanted to restrict it to the interval slightly above the action on the iterated orbit. So I want to put something like Kc, Kc plus epsilon. Then I claim that this is non-zero. Now I want to put my uh, quantifiers here. So for any epsilon sufficiently small, there exists a, key, a threshold k depending on epsilon such that if the order of iteration k is greater than that threshold, this is true. So you, you give me an epsilon, and I find an, I look at, uh, you give me an epsilon, 
I look at the interval from Kc to Kc plus epsilon. And I'm saying that if uh, K is large enough, there will be an orbit with action somewhere here. And this is, uh, uh, this is true in any dimension, provided that you have an S dimension. So the, this theorem implies that there are infinity many. Now let's see how it is proved. Uh, in theorem three, X is an SDM. Yeah. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. The outline of the proof. Oh, would you rather have me uh, prove this theorem one? I don't think I will have time for both. Theorem three is, so I have this uh, orbit about which I have sort of the homological information that it is totally degenerate and I know something about the local um, homology there. Um, I look at the action of that orbit X and uh, its iterations. So if I denote the action by C, I will be, it will be KC and I look at a little you give me an interval slightly above that, the size of the interval field. What I see, uh, what I'm saying is that I can find, if k is large enough, I can find an orbit with action in this interval. For every epsilon. For every epsilon. So you give me an epsilon small enough so, so in, the, in, in, in this terminology, any epsilon at all, and if k is, lo, uh, is large enough, then I can find an orbit with this action here. Closed orbit. And actually, um, I proved this by sh uh, showing that the contact homology for this interval where epsilon kind of, now epsilon got to be small enough, but you choose epsilon first and then k is non-zero. So this ensures that there are infinity many orbits. So uh, once more, we have a choice. We, I don't think we can do both. I can prove either theorem one or outline the proof of theorem three. Theorem three. You think so? I, actually, I thought theorem one uh, was kind of more inter interesting. But the problem with theorem three is, uh, with theorem one is that this part is not really defined. Uh, but, well, which makes it, uh, all right, uh, so let's then, let me work here because I, at least to start with. Uh huh. What do you mean? The uh, uh, well, it is a three dimensional. Well, no, I don't. I don't really need it, but I need X to be isolated. That's important. Right. No, I'm not. Uh, I I don't think I need. The p I need. Uh, I don't need. Uh, the spectrum to be discrete, n uh, not anywhere. But, yeah, but, but if it's not discrete, uh, then I'm done anyway. So, oh. right? Oh. But, but I, I don't think I need it. Yeah, I, I don't think I use it anywhere. Of course, when I, of course, still sort of paper is written and. <laughs> Uh, till paper is written, anything can happen, and even after that, but um, I don't think I need it. All right, let me um, try to prove it then. Uh, theorem 3. So, what do we do in the, let me recall how we do the whole thing in the Hamiltonian case. So assume you have an uh, SDM. Assume you know you have an SDM. You 
take this Hamiltonian provided by Hingston's lemma, and you show, first of all, that it can be extended to a Hamiltonian given Q, uh, Hamiltonian diffeomorphism globally. So you have now your time to, uh, so he, here is your base symplectic manifold B. I still denoted B. Here is a fixed point, which is a, um, um, your SDM. Here is the H. H has a strict flat maximum at that point, and then it does something else. You approximate it from below and above by two Hamiltonians having a pretty much standard shape. The bottom one is, the, is just a bump function, call it K minus. The top one is something like a very flat bump function going down, then staying flat. And then it may need to accommodate the Hamiltonian so it will go up and stay flat there, something like that. And in each case, I actually, I can explicitly calculate the Fleur homology, at least some part of it. And what I... Uh, what we show is that the Floer homology now, so call this guy K plus, Floer homology for the interval, I don't know, KC, KC plus epsilon. And I need to iterate <coughs> things K times. Uh, well, I mean, this one has to go uh, no, no, down and up. Uh, th this, this one, yeah, uh, they look, the they, yeah, yeah, they, uh, they have the uh, same tangency. They have slightly different eigenvalues because one has to fit under the other, but. Yeah, yeah, th this one has small eigenvalues, and that one has, like, nearly zero eigenvalues. So, and here I take uh, the homology for K minus. And, uh, but, but the choice is after the K, right? You pick the K and then you make it very close to the other K. P pick the H. The H is, and then you, then you pick the K plus and K minus, but after a choice of the K, right? Like after the... Yeah, uh, th that's correct. You need to, I mean, you yeah. I want the eigenvalues uh, to remain small after <laughs> I iterate k times. So, but this is about the, this, in, this is the major influence of k small on the choice of these two Hamiltonians. So you show that this map is non-zero, which you can do fairly explicitly up to some nuances. And that may have factors through the homology of H. Iterated K times. So you know that the homology of H is not there. Now, I'm going to do exactly the same thing in the contact case. I use Kingston's lemma to produce Two contact forms. I'm going to sketch the uh, figure in the sort of star-shaped case. So that's my original <coughs> hypersurface alpha, the hypersurface corresponding to the form alpha. This point is my SDM. We should think of it if 
now I'm thinking of the hypersurface if I pick its projection to the unit sphere, the radial projection, then the, the x will look like some closed curve on the three-dimensional sphere. Now let me grow a ridge along here. So I'm taking the sphere here and growing a ridge. And then I do a similar picture. Again, it may need to go outside. <coughs> I do a very similar picture. Um, for the outer Hamilton. So this would be, I don't know, this is alpha, this is beta minus, this is beta plus. And again, I have a map from the contact homology of beta plus to beta minus, which factors through alpha. And if I can show that the map on the level of homology for beta plus and beta minus is non-zero, um, I'm done. Now, uh, one can, of course, sort of calculate the homology of beta plus and beta min minus explicitly and do all the work. But actually, I, don't, uh, I claim one doesn't have to do it. Because, well, usually, actually, uh, things like that are a bit tedious. So I, I don't have to do it because Kind of, you can look at this picture. Let's restrict. How do you solve the problem in uh, in the Hamiltonian case? You look at the at the neighborhood of x, and you look at the part of the homology. Actually, I think let's take a smaller neighborhood. Let's take this neighborhood of x, and you look at the part of the Floer homology generated by the orbits which are contained in that small neighborhood. And I claim that one can make all the choice, choices for these two Hamiltonians so that if epsilon is small enough, then regardless of k, the, this sort of local homology groups are embedded into the global picture as direct summons. Sort of Basically, the point, the point is that for a floor trajectory, to cross, to go sort of out of this part, to enter or go out, uh, that floor trajectory would have to cross some region where the Hamiltonians are flat. And that requires some energy, which is totally independent of anything, depends only on the neighborhood. So if the energy is, uh, if epsilon is small enough, then this part is really embedded in, in the Floer homology for the same interval of action. Sort of, uh, then the part corresponding to this neighborhood sits as a, a direct summand. So I can actually do the same thing in the, con in the contact case. And moreover, what is my lemma? I've erased this lemma, which I, uh, the local lemma which identified sort of the Floer homology local Floer homology and the contact homology. A similar statement holds actually for small intervals of action. So in fact, I can take this Floer homology group and kind of embed it in my, in my contact homology. So in fact, I don't need to redo the calculation. I can just leave the calculation we have done like years back and sort of embed it into the picture. There is a little nuance here. Actually, we did it in the non-equivalent case. There you have the, uh, there you're equating equivalent case, but in that case, uh, the ZK action, uh, because the coefficients are rational, actually will have no effect at all. So I can actually stop now uh, because I'm pre pretty much outlined the uh, proof. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe there is one more thing I would like to say is there is, of course, a, 
a somewhat different approach. Rather than using contact homology, one can use the equivalent symplectic homology. And then all the difficulties with sort of things not being properly defined yet disappear. It's kind of a well-defined theory we are working with. But somehow the argument becomes less transparent. I'm pretty sure it can be translated, but it's not immediately clear how to do it. It's kind of not entirely obvious. So let me stop here.